How's everybody doing this morning? Wasn't that a great breakfast? I love breakfast Sundays. Let's give a big hand to Jeff and his wife who put this together this morning. You know, when Jesus created his first miracle and turned water into wine, it was only the servants that carried the water pots to Jesus that really knew what was going on. So Jeff and his wife are like those servants, constantly carrying the water pots and creating all this great food as a result, and Candace and, and her family too. So for most of you know me, but for the new visitors here, my name is Mark Rossi. I'm one of the elders here at Severn. Ryan, our teaching pastor, is enjoying the very last day of a well-deserved vacation. Now, I'm sure this vacation, in case some of you don't know, the Cox and the Lion Clan every two years go off to, to New Smyrna Beach in, in Florida. And he's gone just about every time, but this time I think it was a little different. I think he might need a vacation from the vacation, carrying the car seat and the pack and play and the diaper bag. It's a little different than when he was a single man. So today I am going to do something bold. I'm going to pinch hit for Ryan, and he'll be back next week. So rest assured, he's saddling up and he's ready to, to kick this series into high gear. But before I start this morning, and my text is on uh, the first book of James, chapter, uh, chapter 1, I mean the book of James, the first chapter, verses 12 through 15. Before I get into that, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have seen the movie Star Wars? How many of you have seen all six of them? Good. I think I have people here who know where I'm going to go today. You know, that film, the very first one, was done in 1977. Many of you here today were not even born when that film was made. And the last one was made in 2005, so there were almost 30 years of this story unfolding for us. And you know, I hear tell that there's going to be a seventh. I can't imagine what it's about, but there's going to be a seventh that's coming out next year in 2015. But you know what? Star Wars has become a worldwide pop culture uh, phenomenon. Everywhere you go, you go into toy stores, you can get the Star Wars action figures, you can get the Star Wars Halloween costumes, you see Star Wars cartoons, and yes, I'm even ashamed to admit it, but on my Christmas tree, you'll find three or four Star Wars action figures. Um, the, the Darth Vader lights up, you plug him into the light, and he goes... <laughs> yes, I'm ashamed. But it's a, it's a phenomenon... And it's all over the place. So we all know the story of Star Wars. It took place a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away when good and evil were governed by opposing sides of the Force. This, this galaxy was ru once ruled by a democratic senate, but an evil Sith Lord, he, he, he uh, poses himself as the Chancellor Palpatine. He comes in... And he, is, he takes power from the Senate. He abolishes the Senate. He takes over in a dictatorship, and he establishes an evil empire. And he rules this evil empire with military power and with oppression. And there's a rebel force that builds up to try to overcome the empire. So these movies were built in two trilogies. There were three movies, actually four, five, and six, came before one, two, and three. And, and then there was a second trilogy later. The first was about a man by the name of Luke Skywalker. The second, by another Skywalker, and his name was Anakin. Both trilogies at the core were about the struggles with trials and temptations. Both ended, though, with very different results. So let's talk about Luke Skywalker. He was a young farm boy, but he was catapulted on a different path after finding the secrets, plans to the Death Star in a droid that he had bought on the farm. The path that leads to trials as he set his mind to become a Jedi Knight, a keeper of the peace who allows this 
force that balances all three things in the galaxy to work and to flow through him for good. With his newly found power, he destroys the Death Star. He, he uh, uh, against all odds, he fights Darth Vader many times. Darth Vader, who is the Sith Lord apprentice, who Luke later learns is actually his father. After many encounters with this guy, throughout the trilogy and the very last movie, he faces the final test, the final trial in this massive lightsaber duel with, with Darth Vader. And all the while, the emperor is enticing him, drawing him in, saying, feel your anger. Feel this power that's welling up within you. I want you to kill Darth Vader and become my new apprentice because then you will have gone over to the dark side of the force. And he almost does it. He's got Darth Vader right there in this lightsaber war and he's about to kill him. And then he realizes, you know what? If I do this, I am going to have the same fate as my father. And he doesn't do it. He doesn't do it. He throws it down, and the emperor is furious. He's furious. He says, fine, if you won't come to me, then die, and he tries to kill him. And of course, Darth Vader must have some spark of light in him because he turns and he picks up the emperor and he destroys him in the whole nine yards. And Darth Vader ends life in the arms of his son, and everything's restored. Okay, let's fast forward to the second trilogy, which is actually the first trilogy in chronology. And we have a second Skywalker. His name is Anakin. Anakin started life as a slave on a remote planet in, uh, in the galaxy. He was discovered by a Jedi Knight, Qui-Gon, and believed to be the chosen one that would restore balance to the Force. You see, the Force was this power that controlled all things, but it had become out of balance because of the evil that had come into the world. The Sith Lords had divided the Force into the good and to the evil. And it was thought through, through um, uh, Jedi prophecy that there would be a chosen one that would restore this. And Anakin was decided when he went, uh, his, his trainer went to the Jedi Council and said, I want to train him. I want to train him to be a Jedi Knight. I believe he's the chosen one. And they reluctantly said yes, and they started to train him. So we went through the trials of, of learning the ways of the Jedi for over a very long point of time. And he was indeed a gifted, he was a very fast learner, but he was overcome with pride. He knew that he was better than everybody else. And he often challenged his master's directions. He challenged the decrees of the council and eventually his pride and his appetite for power overcame him. Seduced by the evil emperor, enticed by the ways of the dark side of the force, making excuses that he really was doing it to save his wife. But in the end, he lost his wife. He lost himself. He lost everything he had ever known. And he sells his soul to the emperor and becomes his new Sith apprentice, named Darth Vader. In the final lightsaber duel, fast forward two whole, two whole movies later, his former teacher, Obi-Wan Kenobi, fights him to the death, leaves him limbless on the edge of a lava lake on this really cool volcanic planet. It was made for great cinematography. But he's there, left for dead. The Emperor swoops in and picks him up and basically places him in this black mechanical suit that serves as a permanent life support system, a mobile prison, a real living hell of his own choosing. So both men, Luke and Anakin, face both the trials of Jedi training and the temptations of the dark side of the force. Both had very similar opportunities presented to them, which ultimately, though, resulted in very different outcomes. James, James opens this chapter by talking about trials and temptations. He's talking to a group of believers. Get this straight. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to believers. And these believers have been scattered throughout the known world at the time because they were under significant persecution 
both from the Romans and even from King Herod Agrippa. It happened around 44 AD. And they, they were also under a lot of trial, a lot of temptation, because as scattered people, they were living among the pagan nations. So in this first chapter, James encourages these scattered believers to stand firm under trials and resist these temptations that they're facing every day among these pagan nations. So uh, Ryan, in week one, did a great job telling us about trials, defining what they are. He said, trials have a purpose, and this purpose is to produce something in us, produce something that completes us and that sanctifies us, that sanctifies us, meaning making us more and more like Jesus. So I thought of an example, a secular example of where that occurs. To think about athletes who determine at a very young age, maybe Eliana's age, to become an Olympic athlete. They have to face trials every single day, getting up at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning and, and disciplining themselves and beating their bodies into submission to work day in and day out, year in and year out sometimes, for one day in the limelight at the Olympics. These trials, though they're very hard and demanding, they're very specific. They have a very specific purpose. They are to produce the results that in many cases would not be acknowledged for many years to come. How about our soldiers' journeys? You know, the Army takes young men and women now from all walks of life, all backgrounds, all educations, all, all nationalities, and they throw them into boot camp. And in boot camp, they train them, and they discipline them, and they teach them to respect authority. Because you know what? When they get in a situation where it matters, it's not time to think anymore. It's not time to question. It's time to act. They go into automatic mode. They lean on their training, and they do. It takes a lot of discipline, but it, they go through a lot of trials. I've never been through boot camp, but I understand it's, it's no fun. It's no picnic. It's grueling, but in the end, the reward is significant. Those trials are designed to save their lives and the lives of their comrades when it counts the most. So standing up to these kinds of trials requires discipline. It requires a focus. So I want to bring you to my first point. Trials are from God. They lead us closer to him. The scripture says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. They are for our good. Trials come from God. They are for our good. They strengthen us. They build us up. They give us the opportunity to learn from the many mistakes that we are going to make along the way. Temptation, however, temptation, on the other hand, is another story altogether. And that brings me to my second point. Temptation is not from God. It leads us away from him. So get that straight. Trials are from God. They are for our good. They strengthen us. But temptations are not from God. The scripture says, let no one say when he is tempted that I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. So one of the chief characteristics of sin is the tendency that we have to pass blame. Either we're trying to deflect blame altogether or trying to make excuses for our sin that seem to lessen the responsibility that we have for it, right? I'm sure that all of you have experienced it's basic human nature to blame shift. It was from the very beginning 
You all know the story of Adam and Eve. God, God created all things and it was good and he saw this dirt on the ground and he, from it he fashioned a man and then he breathed into his nostrils and gave him life and it was good. But one thing he noticed after he created all the creatures and Adam's there naming the creatures, he says, you know what, it's not good that Adam should be alone. So he puts him to sleep, he takes out a rib and from that rib he makes Eve a helpmate that will love him and walk with him. And together, they will have dominion over all that God had created. But there was a catch, just one. There was a tree in the garden. It was a tree that was off limits. It was the, knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, don't, you can eat of anything you want. You have dominion over my entire creation. But of this one tree you shall not eat. Because if you eat, you will surely die. And you all know the story. Eve, <coughs> tempted by the serpent, eats and she gives the, the apple to her husband. So God comes and says, Adam, what's going on? They're here realizing they're naked, they're covered. And Adam says, I don't know, I'm hidden. He says, who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I told you not to eat from? What's Adam say? She made me do it. The woman you gave me, she made me do it. And what does Eve say? Oh man, that serpent that you put on here, he made me do it. He deceived me. Adam was actually not blaming Eve, if you think about it. If you look at the scripture, Adam says, the woman you gave me made me eat. He was really blaming God. If you hadn't put me to sleep and taken out the rib in the first place, this would have never happened, God. It just have been you and me, buds, forever in the paradise, right? What's at the heart of temptation? What's at the core of our sin? And what are the ultimate results? That brings me to my third point. Trials strengthen us, but temptation when given over to sin, will destroy us. The scripture says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Stop blaming other people or the devil. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. It brings forth death. You know, sin is basically at the root the act of going against God's will. It's the act of going against his will in thought. It's the act of going against his will in word. And it's the act of going against his will in deed. So if not God's will, then our will, our own selfish will, will. Bottom line for Adam, he wanted what he wanted instead of what God wanted for him. He was lured. He was enticed. He was tempted by his own desires. God wanted a relationship with man. He wanted to walk together with him in the cool of the evening in the garden paradise that he created. But man had other plans. Man wasn't satisfied. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to know what he didn't know, and that was the knowledge of good and evil. It was his own selfish desires. And as a result of this blatant disobedience, man was banned from paradise. He was found naked and cold and apart from the very lover of his soul that had created him in the first place for that purpose. The rest of the story of the Bible after that is the story of redemption, to restore what was lost in the garden as a result of man's selfish will. The whole thing was put into play to bring man back in relationship with God, the way it was created to be, so all sin, all sin has its roots in our own selfish will. It it's happens when 
when we're lured and enticed by our own desire. And then when we're enticed by that desire, we give in to that desire. And when we give in to that desire, that, that temptation is, it bursts itself into sin. And sin, when it just takes full hold of you, creates death. It's a lust of the flesh. It's a desire of the flesh. Look, at it's gluttony. People who, who go after food in an unhealthy way. A gluttony for money. A gluttony, a desire for power. Power. What is power? A, a, a desire for position. What is position but putting oneself above someone else? What is power than lording over someone else with your will, your own selfish will? But what is the end of sin? It's death. It brings death. So Luke and Anakin Skywalker, they both endured the trials of Jedi training. Both had the same opportunity to be strengthened for good. Both faced, though, the enticing temptations of the dark side of the force, the side that wanted to pull at everything that was in them to become more powerful, to give in to their emotions, to give in to their anger. The character of Luke Skywalker, though, the real chosen one, who, who was foretold by the, the Jedi prophecy, who ultimately brought peace to the Force, he was tempted severely. He was almost overcome by his anger toward the Emperor. But Luke overcame his temptation. Understand this, church. Temptation is not sin. Jesus did not sin in the desert, though he was tempted. Temptation, that evil desire that you have, when you give over to it, it births sin. Luke overcame that temptation. He resisted the drawl of the evil, and he defeated the enemy. Anakin, he took a different path. He was lured and enticed by his pride, his desire for power, his lust of the flesh, his need to control his destiny, his defiant rejection of everything his Jedi masters had taught him, condemned to live out life, imprisoned in the mechanical armor forged by his own selfish will. Two different men father and son, two completely different outcomes. I'd like to ask the, um, the worship team if they would come back up as I bring this in for a close. So how do we as believers living in 2014 overcome temptation? How do we purpose ourselves to live a holy life when we are constantly bombarded with images and messages and feel-good worldviews where God doesn't even exist? I tell you, the first thing that we must do, the first thing that we must do is to submit ourselves to the trials that God brings our ways to strengthen us. You know we have a choice. God brings trials in our lives, and we can either see them as stumbling blocks, or we can see them as weights that a weightlifter uses to build up his muscles. We must submit to the trials that God brings our way to strengthen us. And then after being strengthened, after we've been taught, after we've been trained, after we've stood the test of time, we must fix our eyes on Jesus. 
fix our eyes on Jesus. You know, I, before, before I had kids, I used to attempt to play golf. I don't attempt anymore. I don't know if I had a great golf swing or I had a poor golf swing, but I'll tell you something. There's one secret to attempting to golf well. And you can have the best equipment and you can line up and you can do all that you want, but you must keep your eye on that ball. If you take your eye off for even a second, even a second, you'll lift up and you'll top it and it'll embarrassingly go three or four yards. Or it'll, it'll draw way left or it'll slice way right. But if you keep your eye on the ball and you do everything else right after being trained, it's a beautiful sight. It's a beautiful sight. King David, King David, a man after God's own heart. He wrote almost the entire book of Psalms. He danced before the people half naked to the, to the embarrassment of his wife because he loved God so much. He took his eyes off God. One day when he was standing on a balcony as king and he saw a woman, he could have had any woman in the, in the nation. He had many wives but he wanted someone else's. He saw Bathsheba. He took his eyes off God. And though he repented, church, listen to me, it's not that we sin, because we all do. It's what we do when we sin. And David, when faced with his sin by the bony finger of, of Nathan, confessed his sin and begged God's forgiveness, but he suffered the consequences of taking his eyes off God for the rest of his life. In Hebrews chapter 12, the writer says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. As believers, as believers, church, we can learn from each other. We can hold one another accountable. You know, I'll tell you something, if you're my age or greater and you're not mentoring somebody, you're missing a phenomenal opportunity to take everything that God has poured into you, all the trials that you have been through, and share it with some younger guy, or for the women, some younger young lady who can learn from you. You know, don't mentor five people. Don't mentor three people. Just pick one. Just pick one. And pour into that young man or pour into that young woman. God wants to use you today. He's not done with us yet. We can encourage each other, encourage each other to press on. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul tells us, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So we fix our eyes on Jesus. We submit ourselves to the trials that God brings our ways to strengthen us. We fix our eyes on Jesus. Keep your eye on the ball. But there's yet again one more tool in our toolbox. One more tool. And this is an important tool. We need to see ourselves as God sees us. In Ephesians chapter 1, God tells us that He chose us in Him before the foundations of the world were laid to be holy, to be blameless, before him, he chose us in him to be holy and blameless. He predestined us for adoption 
as sons through Christ Jesus, according to what? To his purpose and his will. And as a result, as a result of his choosing, as a result of his predestination for our adoption, we have obtained an inheritance according to the riches of his grace. Riches of his grace, which the Bible says he lavishes upon us. He doesn't drab them on us. He doesn't drip them on us. He lavishes them upon us because he loves us so much. We are sealed, Ephesians tells us. Sealed, USDA approved, certified organic, sealed with the promise Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. In 1 Peter chapter 2, God tells us we're a chosen race. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Called out of darkness. We all were in darkness, but we were called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once we're not a people, but now we're a people of God. And we belong to him. We need to see ourselves as God sees us. We all too often want to view ourselves as the sinners we were before we were forgiven. Before God opened our eyes to his ultimate truth. Before, as the Bible said, we were new creatures in Christ. Everything that is old is gone and all is new. I understand we sin. I sin every day. And it grieves my heart. Paul even said, all the things that I know I need to do, I don't do. And the things that I want to do, I don't do. We all struggle with temptation. But let me tell you, church, it wasn't my words. Greater is he who is in me that Holy Spirit who has sealed me, than he who is in the world. We overcome temptation, church, by submitting ourselves to the trials he designed to strengthen us, by fixing our eyes on the lover of our souls, on Jesus Christ, the one who chose us before the foundations of the world were laid. He chose us to be his own. Submit to the trials. They're destined by God to strengthen you. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. And walk. Walk proudly in the realization that you're special to him. And he loves you. And he chose you to be his before the foundations of the earth were laid. That's it. Amen.